Hi, Harold. Um, so also, uh, I encourage Harold and Yanni Bart to try to manage the time because we have an extremely packed agenda today, uh, and we're going to try to make through make it through all of it. But uh, we will need to be very conscious of time. Okay, so this is the agenda. We have Harold for ten minutes, uh, and then UN on uh, for ten. Get into WebRTC capabilities for which we've allocated fifteen. Um, back to UN for ten. Uh, they have the NV use cases for 15 minutes, um, and then the rest of the agenda. So hopefully we can make it through all of this. So I am going to turn over the uh, floor to Harold for insertable streams, and then you win. So did no one uh, volunteer for Scribe? I, yeah, I didn't I hear scribe. a volunteer. You'll I scribe. can Scribe, but I'm, I'm not an IRC, though. But I can write it in a document. Yeah, that's OK, I think. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alec. And I'll uh, go quickly through the um, through, through this. Basically, we have a couple of I have a couple of decisions that need to be made on the on the insertable streams for raw media. And uh, I'd like to have the working group look at them. Next slide. So in the original in the proposal I made. I call it the three stages of the breakout box, where stage two was opening up the media stream track so that we can extract the media, but leave all the feedback and signaling down below in the basement. The next slide. So that's the how, how you would use it. Next slide. Well, stage three is the complete break apart, which says that, OK, you have to have the, you handle the media that goes in one direction, and you also handle the feedback that goes in the other direction, such as downstream has stopped. You don't need to send anything more. Downstream wants something different from what you're giving it. And uh, when uh, Guido started implementing it, he said, hey, this is approximately the same amount of complexity. I'm going to implement stage three first. So next slide. So it turned out to be simple to implement stage, what I call stage three, which I think is the final state. I also looked at what it will take to actually shim the, the proposed stage two media processing media stream track in JavaScript. And uh, I'm not that great at JavaScript, but I think it's, it will come out around 10 lines. So since less is more in the, in the area of, uh, of specs and APIs, I suggest that uh, instead of having this uh, processing media stream track be part of the spec, we just delete it and uh, add it as an example of how to handle things if you don't just want to touch the media. So comments, questions? This is one of my two questions. Sounds reasonable to me. Yeah, sounds good. OK, and I'll do it. And then uh, if, you, if someone wants to resurrect it, then I have to bring it up as, an, as, an, as a new, new topic. Next slide. This is from uh, Steely Dan. Uh, should we specify a face tracking API or body tracking API or object tracking API as part of the stuff that we specify? And I'd like to have one, but the three questions I have, is this a separable concern? Is someone else addressing it? If not, how do if both of those questions are answered then no, how do we start? So uh, I suspect that there are other 
others uh, who are working on this. I see that suddenly a link appeared in my, my slides. Yeah, I, I inserted that. That's a TensorFlow example. Hmm. So there is also a, a phase detection uh, API on the Chrome platform status with a, a YCG editor's draft um, as a subset of guess, I guess, of the shape, shape detection API. Hmm. I, so I would also mention uh, that cameras, for instance, do track faces for their internal um, computations. And sometimes they expose that data or they can expose that data. So if you have a get user media uh, track, in theory, you, you could expose that kind of metadata that the camera is already computing. Um, so it, it seems that it would be good for having like some metadata that would tell us what is the result of uh, face tracking so that we could, uh, people could start writing things based on that metadata. I, I don't know where, uh, whether we want a face tracking that is isolated that could use, that could work on any track or just local tracks, but um, uh, that, that could be left to something else. But it seems that being able to define the, the metadata uh, might be useful for uh, developers. Yeah, so we'll... The, pl the place I've su seen suggested as a, as a place that they would link together is actually specifying a means in the video frame construct of attaching metadata, such as a face description. So that might be a point, but th that's also within the web codec working group because we're reusing their video frame. Right. Tim. Uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think there's a slight, I mean, so the, the, the place to look at this is that the this use case is for, is for funny hats, and you just can't do funny hats in a non-discriminatory way unless you've got a decent face tracker. So I, I think, like, coming to your question about whether it's separable, my view is that it isn't because I don't see how you can address funny hats without having something that does does face tracking. And so it's sort of, it isn't a separable issue. Now you can delegate it, but you have to somewhere, have to have somewhere to delegate it to. And I, I mean, I, I like what you're saying about like if the camera, if the hardware is capable of doing it, yes, we should be using that. So one point there. Um... Funny hat is just one transform. You could also do like FaceTime where uh, you, you show your tongue and then it's not a hat, it's uh, your tongue that is changing. You, your face is, is a full unicorn that is. And there it's not just face tracking, it's, it's, a, it's a complex model. So the, the thing is like just tracking the face might be simple, but applications might want more than that. And it's difficult to know where to stop in terms of which metadata to expose and what is actually necessary for the application. Right. I think the risk, though, is that if we don't start somewhere, we're going to end up with everybody implementing this in, in 12 lines of bad JavaScript, and we'll end up with something that is deeply discriminatory for, you know, everybody. Um, I think, and, and not meet the, not meet the goal of even doing face tracking properly for, for you know, a substantial proportion of the users. So I kind of, I'm not fixed on how this is done, but I do think we need to address it. Um, so from the web product side, uh, I just wanted to mention that there are use cases for breakout box that uh, have no need for face tracking. Right. Um, uh, you know, like like Zoom, for instance, would like to have access to your video frames, but, but doesn't necessarily, uh, I guess, I, I, I take that back, actually, as I say it. <laughs> they, they may actually care about face tracking. Uh, uh, still, I think there, there are use cases uh, in web codecs generally for uh, breakout box without face tracking. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, I, I think, uh, for example, you know, just turning the whole thing into black and white or, or modeling an old TV or something, that there's mm -hmm. tons of, of use cases. But specifically, we've called out face tracking as, as the kind of headline use case for this category. 
And and so either we need to take that out of the headline or we need to do it in a way that's so, you know, acceptable. To, to me, it sounds like we probably should discuss that requirement in the NV use cases context. Right. Uh, but it sounds separable enough from the uh, media capture in setable stream context that it doesn't need to be part of that API and so can be left as a, a separate exercise. And again, th there is already an API. I don't know how good a fit it is with our model, uh, but there is already an API being incubated in YCG to do phase detection. So. Uh, it would be logical to include in the examples how to do phase tracking using that API. That may, may actually be a useful, useful addition to the, to the document. I mean, the quality of uh, implementation is, uh, that's a hard one. Uh, Harald, in which document is for my notes? So it's uh, the, uh, it, it's a, uh, Dom insert of the, the link into the document, the shape detection API. It's a WICG document. Right. Okay. So if uh, Bernard, if you do down an app, uh, you should probably probably get the link on link on screen. Yeah. There's next slide and previous slide. So, so back one, see if we can see it. Yep, there it is. No, that's the other one. I think he, he would need to reload, but let's not. Uh... Yeah, but uh, anyway. uh, it's okay. Yep, I think that, I think that's, uh, I think it does, as, it's reasonable to add an example using that, that API, and then we'll have to discuss again whether we need, need to do more. So, I'll take that as instruct instructions to the editor, and then we'll and then, and then we'll leave, leave the leave the bug open for now. So status, I have an experimental implementation done by Guido that's landed in Blink in uh, Chrome and is available behind the flag, and I have a start of a specification, and of course the link is wrong. I'll fix that. Um, so that's the end of my segment. Thank you. I think we made it within time. Okay, you win. You win. I think you're muted. Yep, back online. Um, so I was saying on the other side uh, of the pond. So continuing with instable streams, but uh, this time after the encoder or before the decoder. So we have uh, made an ongoing Safari experiment uh, with support of the SVN transform, GS transform, and combination of both of them with uh, GS transform running in background threads as a default. Uh, it's now available in Safari nightly. Uh, last patch landed uh, this, yesterday or today, I don't remember. Uh, and of course, it's, it's behind a feature flag. Um, so we decided, uh, based on past discussions we had uh, in the past months, uh, to uh, try a slightly different approach, uh, which is to attach transform to senders and receivers. So you can see that there's, uh, the API that is in Safari is adding one attribute transform, uh, to either sender or receiver. The idea behind this, this is that, um, what this feature is doing is really trying to get a frame, do some processing on it, and then pass it uh, on either to the network or to the decoder. So it's really a transform. There's no idea of trying to get the frame and keep it or do something with it. It's really, you, you get it, you transform, transform it, and then you pass it along. So it, it seems nice, given uh, what, what Funky Group Streams has this notion of transform, to, to use that model. So let's see now, next slide, what it gives us for S-Frame. So what we added 
is a simple interface ASIM transform, which has a constructor and which has a, a few methods to basically uh, manage the encryption keys. And then all you have to do is to set sender.transform to a new transform, uh, to a new frame transform, and then you can set the key. And the same on the receiver. So it's very simple, uh, it's very convenient, it, it works well. Um, we added the possibility to have the SRAM transform expose readable and writable getters. Next slide. And the idea behind that is that you can use the SRAM transform not only as a whole, but as a part of the generic transform. Let's say, for instance, that you have a transform that is adding some metadata at the end of frame, then doing encryption. Uh, there are cases like that where you want to add like face tracking information and still encrypt it. So there it's good if you could reuse the SRAM transform to do the encryption, even though uh, the appending of the metadata will be done in JavaScript. Um, by making the SRAM transform a generic transform stream, it's very easy. Uh, let's say we have a readable and writable uh, objects, then you, you just do a pipe through, readable pipe through to the SRAM transform and bang, you have uh, a stream of frames that is encrypted or decrypted in, in that case. And then you can pipe it to your JavaScript transform that will do whatever it wants. And then it will pipe it to uh, the sender or receiver uh, writable. So with that model, um, we see that the combos are working fine. Um, in Safari, the S frame transform is able to uh, process either audio, video, or array buffers. So at the end, it's just an S frame transform is just taking bytes, encrypting them, and sending them. So there's no reason all three of them could not be um, supported. So that's what we've done. Uh, next slide. So uh, the question is, can we update the current Instable Streams API to uh, using the transform model? Um, so for that reason, uh, given there's a need for JavaScript transform, we added in um, Safari a specific script transform that I will show later if we have time. And uh, that is basically allowing you to do JavaScript transform in a worker on encoded frames. But uh, what I want to uh, point out that there is that uh, given how um, Instable Stream is used currently, where people are using it and they're implementing their transform as a transform stream. So what they're doing is they're taking the readable and writable that are exposed currently with the current API and they're piping it to a transform. So it's very, very easy to migrate this code to using the transform getter. Uh, it, it's not changing a lot. It's not changing uh, all the JavaScript that is doing the transform. It's, it's a few lines of code that you can change. And it has uh, a lot of benefits, I think. Um, so the first thing is that we are really talking about the transform. So modeling what it is uh, as a transform API is actually, it actually makes sense and it's, it's beneficial. Um, we also, like if you look at uh, compressed streams or encoded streams, they are not implemented as uh, an array of readable and writable. They are implemented as, as transform streams. And you could, for instance, think that maybe you could uh, gzip uh, encoded frames as well. And then you would be able to just set the transform uh, on the sender to this uh, native transform as well. So this is why I think the model there is right. The other thing I would mention is that readable stream and writable stream might not be enough in all cases. Uh, we know, for instance, that in some cases, we actually want to request a keyframe. Like if you're changing the encryption key, the transform actually wants that there will be uh, a keyframe that should appear very soon. And uh, we do not have a great place with APIs if we are just exposing readable and writable. But if we are exposing a transform, then there are places where we could put that uh, method which are quite natural. Uh, 
and it could be natural for uh, speculators as well as, as developers. And the other things I would mention in terms of benefits as the, the fact that we will no longer expose readable streams, which with the issues like cloning is potential food gain, and we would be able to control the processing so that it's done in the background thread, uh, since doing the transform in a main thread is a potential food gain as well. Um, so question, oh, no, go back. So I have two questions to the working group, uh, and I only have like two minutes left, so I'm not sure I will be able to get to the rest of uh, the, the slides, but that's fine. Uh, the first question is, uh, do the working group think that we could start adding the S-frame transform to its stream streams draft spec uh, along the lines, for instance, of uh, the API that is currently in Safari? And the second question I have is whether uh, the working group think we should update the insertable streams draft spec to use the transform model instead of exposing the readable and writable uh, objects directly. Thoughts? So uh, I'd like to like to start off by saying that by asking, is the transform uh, attribute modifiable? Uh, we can decide. Uh, we can decide that, for instance, it's modifiable. So it's it needs to be um, writable because you need to uh, assign it once. The question yeah. is whether you want to is assign it twice. And this, we could decide either way, either to throw or not to throw. Yeah, so the so the reason I'm asking is that uh, a major part of the hassle in getting to the insertable streams API was was to figure out how to make sure that the very first frame that came along was always handled. And uh, we discovered that uh, streams are somewhat weak in reconnections. Uh, the other question, the, the worry I have with this is actually that the transform model as described locks you too much into the single directional stream. As I mentioned up in the, in the breakout box model, and there is always two flows of data. So I think we'll end up in a situation where we expose multiple streams, both streams of media and streams of feedback data. And locking us into a transform model will actually make that evolution harder, not easier. So um, that's my main problems with this, this particular proposal. I'll leave so, for, open for other comments. So, Harold, just a question. Is the idea that, uh, for example, if your decryptor was for some reason too slow, that, that the feedback would propagate back? Uh, there would be back pressure that would propagate back into the RTP receiver? I mean, back pressure is sometimes a lousy mechanism. I was thinking more of uh, things like, well, when you negotiated the codec, it turned out that you had to do 320 by, by 200 instead of 640 by 480. So you will want to want to pass that information up to, up to the encoder, which is exactly the opposite direction of, of where all the media is going. So one use case that you already identified is um, if you, you might want a keyframe. And uh, if you add the encoder side, the keyframe you need to talk to the encoder, while usually the encoder is feeding you and then you send it. And yeah. uh, so in the current Safari API, uh, there's uh, a method that is actually allowing you to request a keyframe. And uh, your, your JavaScript, you have a context and the context is allowing you to actually talk to the encoder. And at any point in the transform, you can talk to the encoder saying, I want a keyframe. And similarly, we added the same method so that uh, on the receiver side, you can request a keyframe and it will be sent over the network through RTCP so that the encoder on the other side will be notified that it should send a keyframe as well. And uh, that's one way we could implement uh, the, 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 the other pipeline. And that's, that's working well, at least for requesting keyframes. 
Um, so far, I haven't. I, I'm not aware of any any other case where we would like uh, additional um, data to flow on the opposite way. So, for instance, uh, controlling better the encoder. But I do not see how we could not fix that in the same manner, adding uh, additional APIs so that you can control the encoder somehow. You request keyframe, or you want to increase the QP, or whatever. It's not too difficult to add APIs there. Isn't there an issue that your, your, if your transform changes the bandwidth requirements or, or changes something about how the congestion control should work, doesn't that mean that you have to transform the, the request that you're sending up? So I think that in that case, we should think that on the encoder, the transform is just a post processing of the encoder. So I hope that the bandwidth estimation should take into account uh, the transform. And somehow it's a difficult thing to, to you, you will need to talk to the encoder and say, hey, I asked you to do one megabyte, but I'm measuring that you're doing more because of the transform, maybe. In which case, it will be up to uh, the browser to say, okay, I will reduce it to 800 kilobytes, for instance. Or it will be up to a JavaScript transform if we think we need to expose that kind of API. Yeah, I need to think about that. Sorry, Yanivar here. I, I think um, purely from an API point of view, I think it's it's an improvement to have a transform. Because I was a little worried about the existing API uh, that you have basically two ends of a cable. And in order, you're expected to put them both into uh, from and to correctly. Um, and there's nothing to prevent you from you know, what there's opens a lot of questions. What happens if you uh, feed in something that comes from a different sender, for example, if you mix all these cables up? So just having a simple transform stream, I think, is more uh, makes it easier to understand what the intent is in the API. Yeah, it, I like it, that. Yeah, my pro my problem there is that uh, if the, if this is only a temporary a temporary stage, and the next stage is where you actually transform the feedback signals. And, and and detach the two sides entirely from each other. Right. And uh, the transform model doesn't make sense. Uh, maybe. It's it's very unclear now because we, we're talking about this uh, um, signaling uh, on, the other, on the other side, but we have only very few use cases or uh, the current API is not tackling this. Uh, the transform API is only tackling this for request keyframe, which is already an improvement and which is very similar there. So it's very difficult to judge uh, both approaches based on um, something where, which is not precisely defined what we want to solve. And uh, so, I mean, we, we would need to make uh, big improvements in precisely what we want to solve with uh, the over signaling uh, channel before uh, judging uh, either approaches there. And um, I'm happy to do it, but I, I don't want to uh, make the decision pending on that because uh, I think we, we, would need, we need to make progress there. And uh, currently, with what we want to uh, solve, it seems that uh, the proposal there is an improvement. Um, so uh, it's an uh, action item me to come up with uh, the actual proposal for what, what I think we should do next. So we can evaluate so, whether well, this is, uh, this so is a back, proper back, or a help. So back to the question. Um, so there are two questions. The first is, can, so let, let's talk about the first one. Um, is there consensus to add the S-Train transform to instable streams to add spec? I think I would support that. Yeah, I, I, I would not until we understand what all the use cases are for insertable streams. Um, you mean the S-Frame transform or, or the general? Thing? Well, uh, I, the, the S-Frame transform makes sense to me if, it's, if the only use case is end-to-end -end encryption. But we've talked about other use cases, such as taking the stream and 
like piping it into another transport or something like that, which it wouldn't meet the transform model. So Bernard, are you, <clears throat> I'm not sure if you're saying it shouldn't be part of insertable stream, but a separate spec, or you're saying it, it's not clear it's the right model yet? Well, I, I'm not clear what, what all the use cases are that this spec is trying to address. So if it's only end-to-end -end encryption, I understand what UN is saying, but I've heard other things such as supporting other transports and stuff like that. Um, so, so I think one benefit actually is that this constrains a little bit the number of use cases that we are aiming to solve. And uh, I think this uh, is a good replacement for the use cases that were mentioned from, from the beginning. Um, so if, if the existing API supports other use cases than the one they were designed for, that seems uh, problematic a bit. So I think this is a good replacement. And in general, um, we, we know two use cases. Uh, one is end-to-end -end encryption. The other one is metadata insertion or things like that. Um, there, it's supported in both cases. Uh, the other use cases are less documented, so it would be good to document them. Uh, with both approaches, uh, you get the encoded frames anyway. So if you want to send them to another transform or to serialize them through WebSocket, uh, you can do that as well. Uh, there's no difference with any approaches. Well, but in those other use cases, the feedback does come into play. Um, so understanding the feedback model, I think, is important for those other ones. But the existing API doesn't handle that either, does it? No. No. Uh, right. it, it, basically, that you know, we've talked about. Uh, there, it's a question of how far is this API going to go in terms of use cases? You know, are are they going to extend it to support other transports, other cases where the feedback becomes very important? So when you say over transport, uh, currently it's tied to RTC, RTP sender. So I, I don't right. really see which transport we are talking about there. Well, in theory, at least, because it's a stream, you could pipe this into web transport. Now, if that wouldn't work because the congestion control would get all messed up. Um, but why, but why think, would you do that? Yeah, you, you want to use web codex there where you have the encoder as a box, then you place the same S frame transform, uh, and then you pipe the results of the transform to uh, the web transport. That's the model there. But uh, I think that it's a separate world, except the, with the idea that you could reuse the S frame transform, for instance, or uh, JavaScript code that you would write. And uh, as I showed in the example, the S frame transform, for instance, is taking encoded audio frames. So it's fully, it's not related really to uh, RTC, RTP sender, except that it needs put to, to get either audio frames, video frames, or array buffers. Yeah. And WebConnect can provide that. There are other use cases that have the same issue, though, that even the metadata, once it gets too big currently, it'll break. Um, anyway, it's just a question about the, the, it's more of a question about how the congestion control works and whether it can be uh, explicitly understood. I, I kind of just, I, I do like this. I think it, we, should, we should go for it. Because my first question when I looked at the original API is, is it a transform or not? Mm -hmm. And so like this I mean, helpfully answers the question without me having to ask it. So I think that's kind of it, indicative that it's useful. Uh, it was, an, it was a, defined as a socket in which the transport fits. And uh, that and that was. Uh, always a little bit hard for those who expect anything with readable and writable to be a transform. I also think when we when we uh, accepted this document, uh, it was contingent on that we would try to solve end-to-end uh, -end encryption better than the original API was doing. So I think that this, uh, this is a good step towards that, I think, by adding S transform, S frame transform. Yeah, I'm, I'm... I support that in a frame transform, although in the example I saw that the key was exposed to JavaScript and that was a concern when we decided not to. So the, uh, the, 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 yeah, go ahead. 
So well, well, that, 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 that was just it. That, that, so is is there a way to use the spring transfer without exposing the key to JavaScript? Right. Um, so the key is a crypto key, which is which can be either extractable or not extractable. Right. So if it's right. not okay. extractable, then uh, you you cannot get it. You cannot get the key okay. material from from the object. But still, okay, you so need it's... to create it somehow. And okay. the creation of a key is not solved yet. So you would still need to do that in JavaScript at some point. So I think we're reaching, uh, we're over time here. Is yeah. there something uh, we should do on the mailing list? How do we follow up? Yeah, it would be good to have an action item to understand how we can get consensus there. So defining the, I, th I think we have a, something approaching rough consensus of defining the S frame transform as an object makes sense. But the actual actual API for plugging it into in, into the sender and receiver is I don't think we have consensus on that. So yeah. if we go back to questions, there are two questions. The first question seems yes there is rough consensus. And the second one we need to uh, continue working on it and to get consensus. Um, so for the second one, which action, so it seems there's a one action item for Harald to uh, provide use cases um, for um, the secondary channel. And maybe Bernard could also help because it seems you have use cases there. And yeah. based on that, we will be able to reassess uh, the current model the transform model and then be able to to validate either approach is that correct that sounds like a reasonable proposal okay cool have we got that down in the notes i noted that we have rough consensus on uh, an s frame transform but not on how that api should look like and right. that uh, harald should follow up on use cases and then we can take it from there does that make sense okay good all right uh so we're now at the capabilities portion of the agenda and i'm going to turn it over to jan ivar All right, thank you. So this is uh, really slides from uh, that I prepared for an earlier meeting and uh, was also presented to the uh, ping uh, a couple of months ago that uh, we have the privacy interest group uh, review uh, some APIs in both Media Capture and here in WebRTC. And uh, specifically, they were mentioning uh, sender get capabilities and receiver get capabilities for audio and video. Um, the three issues they filed uh, which one is open and they are uh, get capabilities seems to leak hardware uh, cap capabilities without permission uh, in two forms and then stats API should require additional permission and allow piggybacking get capabilities on most recent offer or answer from Henrik which has a PR next slide <clears throat> so this is what we presented to them uh, basically that well um, while a site can learn about a visitor you know a site could learn about a visitor's underlying hardware capabilities without a permission prompt or some other positive affirmative action by the visitor. That was the concern. However, most of the same information is already available in the SDP offer from PC Trade Offer, uh, which is inherently needed uh, as it needs to be signaled by JavaScript to form a, uh, to set up a peer 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 to peer connection as described in JSON. And uh, there are use cases for that that don't uh, necessarily rely on uh, camera and microphone permission, which is data channels, receiving media, and sending media other than camera and microphones or screen capture. For example, capture, streams captured from canvas or element or from other peer connections. Next slide. Um, so we already have fingerprinting notices in the spec about this. And <clears throat> Bernard uh, graciously provided a document that's called graphics hardware fingerprinting. Uh, which mentions, which looked into this and says that information relating to graphics hardware capabilities provided by WebRTC and stats and SVC may also be inferred from other sources such as WebGPU, WebGL, and performance API. And therefore, graphics hardware fingerprinting concerns are not WebRTC, WebRTC specific. Uh, and that we would consider 
we would recommend considering adding permission related to whether the page is permitted to know what graphics hardware the user is running. And that's a problem that's outside of RTC. So the proposed solution for now was just to include a note relating to implementation issues with hardware capabilities. And sorry, I misspoke. We actually ran out of time to present this slide to uh, Ping, but I believe right. we followed up with an uh, email uh, later, or at least on GitHub. Is that fair? Yeah, on GitHub. Okay. Uh, next slide. Um, so I guess, were, were there any questions on the previous slide? I should say first. Or any, or any disagreement the, with what's described there? Right. Because this is basically our, our, our working group's position uh, on, on this privacy issue. And so we would like to make sure that that is correct and that we can stand by that. If there are no issues, I'll just uh, well, think about that. I'll just continue on. And please raise the issue if you, if you can think of some. Uh, similarly, a stats API should require additional permission, they said, through two privacy harms, uh, leaking communication uh, and plain text. Uh, while that might be useful consideration for WebRTC identity, which supports isolated streams, for regular streams, the web page already has prior access to audio and video and text. So uh, that is not an issue. Um, and again, hardware fingerprinting through the decoder implementation and codec members in the Stats API, and also certainly covered. Uh, the issue there is similar to the previous slide. The so next slide. Okay. Um, and this one is from Henrik. Uh, yes, I did want to follow up on uh, exactly what the requirements are of get, get capabilities. Um, but I, I think this, because we have a packed agenda, uh, and this might get into a little bit of the nitty gritty details, I'm happy to skip this. And then if time allows, we can take it at the end. OK. Uh, well, how about if we do this and we'll move on to Johannes? Yeah, so hello everyone, my name is Johannes. Uh, so I work at Google and we have a, a proposal here to add, uh, to extend the media capabilities API to also include WebRTC. Um, so I, I guess you're familiar with the media capabilities API, but the idea is that a website should be able to just query and for particular particular video conf configuration and ask if this will be Will give, give a smooth experience, and also it also so it has three different results. So we'll say supported, smooth, and power efficient. Uh, okay. So the idea here is to extend that API to also include WebRTC, both on the encode and decode side. Um, so it's currently what we could do is from the RTC RTP receiver and RTC RTP sender to get call this get capabilities which will then just give a list of codecs, but you don't know the, know the expected performance of these codecs. Mm. Um, so that's the proposal that I'm, I'm having and would, would like to get input on. Any? Anyone so is, is, is this uh, kind of a, to help with web codecs, or is it just for, is the idea that this would be used by WebRTC folks? Used by WebRTC folks, so it's, it's uh, separate from web codecs. OK. Um, yeah, so it would, it would be used by, by like a application when, it's, when, it, when it should select the, the codec and resolution to use. So then it can do a good selection before the meeting starts. Yeah, uh, I like this approach. I think that um, in general, the closer we can get APIs between regular streaming and WebRTC, the better it is. And this is one thing that we are seeing there. We we are seeing use cases where WebRTC is used only for uh, uh, receiving, not encoding at all. And right. it's just a, it's just a matter of a technology and like being. Uh, low latency or not, that people are choosing WebRTC versus uh, non-WebRTC. So getting API like media capabilities uh, as a replacement, as a future replacement to receiver sender get capabilities seems good. 
especially uh, since the, the model is uh, slightly better, it's asynchronous, uh, and we are seeing that synchronous get capabilities is difficult. Um, there's, there are also other parameters like supported smooth power efficient, which might be nice. And the story in terms of sanitization or fingerprinting is, is a bit easier also to, to handle. So uh, I like this approach and I, I hope like, that we can move forward with this. Yeah, I think it looks good as well. Uh, just a question, is this everything we need to deprecate get capabilities or is there more needed before we can do that? So we'll, we'll just get yeah. um, Does this fully replace get capabilities today? No. Okay. What is missing? There's RTP header extensions and get capabilities. Right. Yeah, the thing is, get get capabilities mixes currently the Weber C one, right? It mixes RTP stuff with media stuff. So it's kind of this okay, weird but, mixture, and you wouldn't want to shove the RTP stuff into the other one. So, right. so all the RTP stuff can be accessed synchronously, though, right? Uh, There's no. I wouldn't bet on that, but uh, okay. you you would think so because it's mostly about it's mostly software, right? But uh, yeah. I've been wrong before about that that kind of stuff. I like that you you call RTP sender get capabilities and you get RTP capabilities. So it seems yeah. like yeah. A, a good separation mm -hmm. of concerns there. Yeah, we, have, we do have some other access methods for RTP RTP header extensions that we have pro been pro proposing. Right. So I have Maybe a question. Is, yeah. is, is it, um, do we give any sort of guidance in the spec how to define what, you know, smooth means or power efficient? Because uh, one difference between, you know, playing a YouTube video or something is with encoding and decoding, uh, what experience you get might depend a lot on, you know, is this a one person meeting or a 50 person uh, meeting? So I'm wondering if the, if it's less clear what this API should uh, return or, or if this is just the browser's best guess. Oh, I agree. That's, that's one, uh, one of the problems I would say with the, with the, with the, the API that it wouldn't, uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't have the, like uh, the best answer to to that meeting with uh, several participants and also with encoding and decoding going on going on at the same time. Uh, so the hope, but, but the hope is that it still provides valuable information for the for the website. Yeah, I, I would agree that uh, you know some rough information is is much better than. Uh, no information at all uh so I'm, I'm happy to to move forward with this but it's been one of those questions i've always wondered exactly what what it means to be power efficient so one example where it's it's a bit better as well is we, we are trying in safari to say okay this codec is hardware supported so it should be up in the list of get capabilities codecs so we order the list thinking that yeah first codec is more power efficient and that's the way we're doing, but it's it's not great. It's 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 better if we could have just an attribute saying, yeah, it's power efficient. So uh, from the spec side, uh, when these booleans were defined, uh, the, the power efficient, the intention was that uh, uh, we not get too bogged down uh, with like the details of like, okay, what exactly is a power efficient power draw? Um, uh, the idea was that it is kind of a relative thing that like, uh, if you have a software, uh, codec, uh, you know, at a low resolution, which on a, the given device draws, uh, roughly the same amount of power as a hardware codec, uh, or less power than a hardware codec on that same device, uh, for a different codec, then we should call both codecs, you know, power efficient. Um, without being too worried about exactly how much power or, or even whether or not it truly was decoded in hardware. 
Um, having said all that, uh, the spec is, is very vague on this point, and uh, I'd be happy to um, uh, clarify uh, what I just said uh, more formally. So this is just like an example how, how you would call it. So you define the, the, like the audio and video content and just uh, uh, call this asynchronous function. Um, I also have, have, have like a first slide with a few like uh, ways, but they're, they're more related to implementation issues. Um, you take the next, the next slide. Uh, I wasn't sure if there would, would, would be any, any privacy discussions or not regarding this. But I, but I guess if you would have this uh, general consensus that a user shares uh, hardware information, then this would be covered by that, that as well. Okay. Thanks. Great to hear that you're positive this proposal. Mm -hmm. So I heard uh, positive feedback from everyone that spoke. Is there any objection? No. I think it's all positive. I'm assuming it doesn't expose more information than get capabilities does. Is that fair? Well, it does. It does. I mean, that's kind of the idea. It does, it does expose more. But Get capabilities does not say anything about power efficient or smooth or oh, sure, anything sure, like sure. that. Yes. So, I mean, you could yes. try and uh, trial and error, you know, do a loopback call and yeah. like try to measure it yourself, but that's kind of right. silly. Well, I, I guess it's up to, to that working group to get uh, a ping review on this. So I'll, I think uh, it looks I was going positive to... with that. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was going to ask about this. Have you gotten any feedback already from the privacy IG on, on media capabilities? Uh, so we have had some discussions with the, the Chrome privacy team, and, I, and we'll be a meeting tomorrow, actually. Uh, but I think it seemed quite positive and yeah. seemed don't, not, not too worried about the API. That from that point of view. Yeah, well, I mean, unlike the, uh, the get capabilities, right? This could be subject to permissions. So, mm, I think yeah, it's better from that perspective. I, I guess so. So the since this, this is an existing API, so the existing API that does not have any permissions, as far as I know. That's that's correct. Uh, when the media capabilities API was launched um, uh, and like these privacy discussions came up, uh, the the answer was was mostly that like yes, we are exposing some information about your device uh, performance, um, uh, but uh, we expect devices to kind of fall into big buckets of uh, common capabilities uh, such that uh, you know it, every MacBook looks relatively uh, the same as every other MacBook uh, and every Android phone looks the same as every other, you know, like the, the, with uh, with some caveats, right? Um, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, we uh, there hasn't been a, a, uh, a ping review of the API that as far as I'm aware. Hmm. All right, well, I think from our working group point of view, this seems like the right way to consolidate information in the proper place, because and I know uh, there's always going to be fingerprinting risk here. I mean, the websites today are already using things like Navigator. Hardware concurrency to try to figure out whether to right. show you know, HD or not. So there are already uh, similar uh, concerns there, I guess. So hopefully, uh, privacy review will go well. But from our working group, it seems like a better way to uh, yeah. Yeah, we're putting the information in the right place. Is there an action item at some point for us to follow up with a ping together? Uh, I, I mean, I feel like we've had these very uh, different interactions with ping, and they're not unified in any way. Hmm. I'm just asking. Hmm. Anyway, I think we've given our feedback on it. Right. So hopefully. Uh... I guess we would recommend you get you try to reach out and get the ping review. Perfect. Thanks. 
So uh, yeah, just to maybe another thought on this, if a notion of permissions get into the picture and if we believe this is a better feature for what we provide today with get capabilities, I think it would be useful for us to understand the impact on how one would use this in, com in combination with WebRTC once a permission prompt comes up. And maybe that won't ever be the case, but, but if there are significant changes in the underlying user interactions for that API, I think that would be useful for us to, to be aware right. of. Okay. I think we finished the discussion on, on capabilities and then uh, the floor is given to you in. Okay, um, so we are going to media capture. Um, and we identify that web pages tend to favor using camera presets. So typically a camera is working well for uh, discrete resolutions like HD, SD and so on and discrete frame rates as well. And um, if you select, if the web page is selecting something else, then maybe the user agent will try to downsample or do, do some things there uh, to try to uh, match what the web page is asking. But usually web page is trying to get the native uh, resolutions because it's good for performances and image quality. So there are ways to try to get to the camera presets. You can use resize mode, frame rate, ideal constraints with eight uh, ideal constraints. But really it's hard to master and it's also difficult to get it right cross browser as well. And even though you get to a camera preset, uh, there's no easy way to know whether the one that is found is the most suitable one. So uh, it's, it's very difficult to, to get it right. And I believe that Enric is working on exposing pixel formats as well, which is a nice idea. And things might get even more complex if we start exposing that. Uh, um, so the proposal there is to define a more straightforward API. Basically, we would expose camera native presets similarly to how it's done by VOS to native applications. Of course, we would only expose that after get user media granted. So that's why it's currently put in the media stream track level. That way, uh, there's not really any more fingerprinting issue really because you already granted access uh, to, you, to, your, to, your <coughs> to your camera feed. Next slide. So let's look at uh, what it could look like. Um, that's just a rough proposal. So the idea would be to have a dictionary uh, of a media device preset with uh, a width, an height, and a frame rate as a range. And then there would be a getter at the media streak trim track level to get uh, a, the sequence of presets. Um, we could add that somewhere else, like uh, get capabilities maybe, uh, but I thought that it's better to keep it separate because get capabilities is mostly about constraints. And then, there's a simple example there where you get the track from Get User Media. You, get, you then select the best preset given the list of presets, and then you apply constraints. Uh, and, and you're done with it. Next slide. The additional thing that would be nice is that we could reuse the same API, the same dictionary, um, to define what mock capture devices would be. So, mm. so that way, um, we would be able by doing that to test really how we are validating constraints in browsers because our mock capture devices would be very similar to real devices and we would be able to know when the user agent is downsampling for instance and when it is not so um, matching ideal constraint computing fitness distance we could see we could be able to to test that so that would be good and that's of course good for websites because they would be able to use more realistic mock devices than they are currently. Like, um, so that's the proposal. Thoughts? 
Uh, I like all of this except for the fact that uh, you open up the camera first and then you have the, the presets and then you apply constraints, which I think would translate to the camera is opened and then you reconfigure the camera and it glitches out a bit. So, so I think this would be user visible um, that you're doing this in two steps. Yes and no. Uh, it's up to the user, user agent to do that. Uh, what we would be planning to do would be to uh, start, like, start setting up the camera until the get user media promise is resolved. So there would be a slight delay in the opening. And then as soon as the promise is resolved and the callback, the JavaScript callback is synchronously implemented, we have the final settings where we would open uh, the device. So it would be only configured once. There would be a slight delay, but I think it's, it's fine this way. And if implementations do not want to do that, they could still do what you're saying, which would be uh, like what's available right now. And I believe that it will only happen the first time because the second time, more probably you have the device ID. So probably you also have the presets. So you're fine. So there would be this window of time, window of time where inside the promise resolve callback, that's when you apply uh, constraints. And if you if you miss that window of time, then it would open. Basically what you would do, uh, so you have a promise, there's a callback, which is a, the web page callback, and then you would enqueue another callback for you to open the camera. So that it's done okay. synchronously. Yeah. That's one implementation, but it's uh, so, it's really up to the user agent to do it. I'm a bit concerned that this adds to the complexity for, you said there were already ways to do this. And I, I would have assumed that you could get most of the same benefit by specifying resize mode none, and then specifying close to the, res the ideal resolution that you wanted, and that it would return, it would set the camera to the closest native resolution for you automatically, and then you could use get settings to verify. It. What about right? the frame rate? What about the frame rate, for instance? Uh, and also, uh, resize mode is not always uh, available, or maybe you have a width of an A, which is, uh, let's say, 100 by 100. So maybe you will want 120 by 160, and then it's up to the user agent to, to crop it or do things like that. But it's, um, it, it's really difficult. So then you would need to use aspect ratio as well. And uh, that makes things complex. A bit. You say complex, but not impossible. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, nothing is impossible, I guess. But uh, we, we would need people to implement uh, resize mode, aspect ratio properly. Uh, and we would need the fitness distance to be uh, implemented the same in all browsers and all, all this stuff as well. Um, I would not bet on that. So there we have something that native applications are used to. I don't believe that there's a fingerprinting issue. At least it's mitigated. So we are closer to what native apps are doing. So why not? Well, um, well, I would actually hope that browsers would implement fitness distance consistently. And I know that uh, Firefox does not yet implement resize mode. So I'm wondering how much of this would be alleviated if we got around to implementing that properly. Um, yeah, I, I guess I would like to see more data uh, about the difficulty with living without this. Um, what, what do you think about the mock part? The, the... Oh, I think the, the mocking uh, part, I don't have a problem with. Okay. And I, I, I think it makes total sense to expose it this way. I'm still a little bit not sure about 
this idea of applying constraints in the same like it works i get it it works it's it just seems a bit strange to do it in two steps um i i do think that john evers like if you do what he said like used ideal constraints it's probably gonna work like 99 percent of the time uh but i'm sure there's some odd camera where the frame rate is messed up so i'm wondering how important it is uh, i i think the real importance might come into when it comes to avoiding like mjpeg uh, decompression or stuff like that but that's not really part of this proposal so yeah, I, I know i think i think it makes sense i I'd, I'd be happy to see it implemented but i i'm also not sure if we can live uh, like maybe we can live without it so i'm, I'm not really i don't have a strong opinion uh, i think it's it's true for uh, with the nate for uh, frame rate, uh, uh, I looked at a little bit of uh, some of the macOS and iOS cameras, and they have frame rates that are uh, widely different. Some it's 10, some it's 11, some it's 15, 16. So if you select 15, for instance, uh, maybe you will get it, and that's fine. Or maybe it will be 30 frames, and then uh, Safari will down uh, with that support to 15 frames per second. And that's a bit sad, uh, but maybe that's fine. I, I don't know. Yeah, I Would think we're going to have to close off this discussion to get on to the rest of the presentations. Right. Do we have a Sorry, set just gonna, next steps? Or? I was just going to suggest, would it be useful to maybe expand resize mode none to suggest that uh, it might infer something about frame rate as well as within night, for example? That if you specify resize mode known, then the the browser would try to find not only native resolutions but native frame rates for the closest. Maybe, or it should be frame rate decimation known, I guess, something like that. I don't know. Or we could add that, yeah. All right. All right. So we're gonna move on and give the floor to Tim. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So these are use cases that you uh, that we already kind of mentioned at TPAC, um, and the idea is to try and expand on on the NV use cases, but basically learning from stuff that nearly works in WebRTC 1.0. Um, so like this isn't stuff that's kind of totally uh, out there, totally weird. It's it's like things that people are trying and doesn't don't quite work because. We're missing some API points or some some features. Um, uh, when I first talked about this at, at TPAC, it was pointed out that these aren't all new, and so I've kind of rejigged it so that it tries to slide in with the existing use cases that are um, that are in the document and sort of add a, add a few requirements to those. And then, so there are four where we we extend the existing ones, and there are three where I'm adding new uh, new use cases and and. My hope is to try and get some feedback from from the the working group about which of these we think are good candidates to work up into into adding as a as a full PR. Next slide, please. So, um, a quick summary on on the four we're going to kind of look at changing is um, I want to improve the user experience for media calls that are preempted, particularly on mobile. I want to extend the use case for IoT. Um, to work in isolated networks. Uh, I have a thing with funny hats, as you've heard, and I kind of want to put that somewhere. I want to put a tag down on it somewhere. Um, and um, I think it's possible to do SFU and MCU in the browser with relatively small changes to the spec, and I think that would be a useful add-on. Um, so uh, next slide, please. So the. Detail on this one, um, basically when you have a GSM call uh, comes in and you're taking a, um, a, a call uh, using WebRTC in the browser, typically um, on a mobile that something will drop, and which is annoying for the person who's, who's getting the incoming call, but it's not disastrous because at least they know what's happening. But the uh, remote user has absolutely no idea why their video call is just frozen. Um, and so the idea is to try and provide some me mechanism for allowing the remote user to know what's happening. Um, kind of think of it as on hold music. Um, 
in, in effect or, or a message or something. And then the second thing is that once that's over, it would be really good if you could get the call back. Um, and, and there's a sort of side thing there, which is that if in the meantime somebody's browsed away, it would be good to be able to get that back as well. I'm less stuck on that, but I definitely think that, you know, during an in, post an interruption, you should be able to get back to where you were. Um, so uh, I don't know how you want to kind of, if anyone's got like burning issues with them, with these, maybe uh, uh, speak now or or we could kind of pick them up at, at the end. I don't know how we'll work uh, best. But. Why, why don't we ask them during, um, I have a, just a question. When you say drop media, do you refer, are you referring to incoming or outgoing? Um, the behavior seems to be that um, that quite often you'll lose the call completely. Um, okay. uh, within typically within, I mean, I haven't tried it recently, but I, I, this is driven by the fact that a whole bunch of people who've implemented um, what are effectively soft phones as native apps using the WebRT, lib WebRTC because it's not possible to get this behavior correct in the browser. So my motivation is to try and kind of fix that problem. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has got anything else on this one. So next slide then. Um, so this is one about uh, kind of baby monitors, respiration monitors, and what you find is quite a lot of use cases that are, a lot of the time they're done the people viewing the video are not that far away in the network terms from the device. And this is different from video conferencing where typically we're all spread out over the internet. And, and what that means is that if the internet, if the internet drops, it's still useful to be able to communicate locally over the LAN. Um, so the idea here is that, that if you've already had a connection that was established, that, that they've already done an offer answer, that you could somehow revive that without needing to go through the signaling server. So that would allow you to continue monitoring the baby or re re restore a session to the baby monitor from your, you know, your lounge or whatever, without even if your 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 DSLs dropped. Um, and that there are a bunch of use cases, and particularly if you look at industrial internet, where this is actually really really quite nice to um, uh, to have. So I kind of, and I don't think it's super difficult. Um, I think it's perfectly kind of doable. Uh, so that's that's a goal there. Um, any so immediate remarks on that? Just want to mention that with Service Worker, for instance, you could have uh, an offline page. So even if your DSL connection is off, then you can load a web page and yeah, maybe this web page would like to get access to the baby monitor or to the local camera. Um, I'm wondering why IoT sensors could not be HTTP servers, though. In which case, uh, once the signaling is done and you know where is the HTTP server, you could tackle the HTTP server to do the signaling for it and do like a regular WebRTC connection. Yeah, the, the issue is those things n almost never have uh, certificates. So so we're not able to do um, do WebRTC with them. You, yeah. you, it, it, you get, I mean, occasionally you can like brute force a, a one in there, but it's, it's a pain in the neck. Mostly yeah. those devices don't. Okay. So you so you can't do HTTPS with them, but you can do you you can do WebRTC as long as the candidates are in the local network, right? As long right. as you get the description from them, provided you can. I mean, the the the, the problem becomes that the candidates. Uh, it actually comes down to being able to keep the uh, candidates the same as last time, or or make them guessable, uh, make them that? predictable. Can or, you use or NDNS. Reusable will do. Or even NDNS candidates should be working. Right. Right. I mean, the, 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 there's a bunch of ways to solve this, and it actually turns out mostly to be an ice problem. 
Um, but I, I didn't kind of want to do the solutions here. Um, yeah. well, I, I, I agree with the, I agree with the, with the requirements. Cool. Um, so let's move on to the next one then. Uh, yeah, we, we kind of talked about this, but I, I again, I, I think we, we do need to have some sense of face tracking kind of in the group. Um, I, I'm uncomfortable with it being delegated elsewhere without us at least having it in there. Whether it needs to be a requirement here or not, I, I, I'm prepared to um, discuss or, 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 or back down on or something, but, but I do think we should have it somewhere in the group as a, as a thing that we keep in mind, because it, it, it's definitely an issue for uh, a lot of people. So we'll, we'll, maybe we'll move on because we've talked about this a little already. So, so next slide, please. Yeah, um, this one. Uh, this is a, this is really about um, the idea that uh, as people get more and more bandwidth and more often get symmetrical bandwidth, it turns out that like relatively small um, conferences can be handled by their device, their own devices, without needing a server, uh, and so to to handle the video mixing. So. I'm interested in the idea that we could like run an SFU and an MCU in the browser. You can kind of already do it with a with Canvas hacks and 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 um, web audio. But I think if we actually had a requirement and we had a, a use case for it in the document, then that would kind of drive some of the thinking around maybe extending some of those APIs or, or loosening some of them up so that these things could could be could be done. Um, I suspect that kind of some of the insertable stream stuff maybe plays in here, or I don't know. Um, well, I, 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 one thing I'd like to get clarification, if you're talking about SFU, then you're requiring the browser to be able to receive simulcast, uh, which is actually a pretty complicated thing. But is that really the requirement? Or are you thinking uh, of just, just being able to receive multiple streams? Or uh, I want to get I'm, down into it. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Maybe SFU MCU is a, is a is a mistake. Maybe maybe I should have put more generally conferencing engine. Um, so I mean, you know, I've already done experiments with with audio conferencing in from purely in the browser, and it and it works really really well actually, shockingly well. And um, the video equivalent uh, is um, is unsatisfactory because then you end up having to effectively do a video mix on a canvas, um, which kind right. of actually works better than I expected, but but you end up um, basically re-encoding. Um, you end up using many more hardware encoders than you should do, because you end up, end up re-encoding it multiple times. So, so to be, be clear, what you want to do is take four, like four streams and just shove them up on the screen in a more efficient way. Just trying to understand. No, the, it, it's 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 the outbound. So if I've got if I have if I'm hosting this if I were hosting this meeting, you would all be sending your video streams to me, and I would be doing a mix that would produce this bar at the bottom, on a on a canvas, and I would then send out a single stream to okay. each of you, which was the bottom bar, um, and and what happens at the moment is you end up re-encoding that bar for each. Uh, for each recipient, whereas that's completely unnecessary. I only need to use one H.264 or VP9 encoder to do that in theory, but the APIs don't let me do that. Well, the next topic on the slide, if we get time for it, might help there. Right. Okay, right. so let, let, let's move on then. <laughs> next one. Um, yeah, so these are the new, new use cases. Um, decentralized web for kind of Data channel -y stuff, um, low latency P2P broadcast for auctions and betting, and reduced complexity signaling. So, next slide, please. So, yeah, decentralized internet. The idea is that like, there are a bunch of interesting P2P services that you can run in the browser these days. Um, and the problem is that what you see is that they are, you end up having to re architect them, whether they're Running in P2P mode, or whether you've got a small server, like you know, a home server or something, running that um, that service, and and so the idea is to somehow abstract the um, the API somewhat, so that the the service is written to the fetch API, but it may end up being 
uh, getting its data over P2P link rather than over actually over HTTPS link or, or quick or whatever. And so the idea is to try and um, mock, basically mock the result of a fetch so that these things can use the same API and not care whether the data is arrived over a P2P link or, or, or over a, um, a plain fetch. And it turns out that it's actually relatively simple to do if you could do data channels in service workers, which because they can already intercept fetch. Um, got a lot of interest from that from, the, from, from Matrix. And obviously, Pipe, we would love to be able to do it as well. <coughs> I think some people are doing it already by intercepting in service worker then sending it to a service worker client for press message and then doing the fetch doing the data channel thing in the web page and then sending back as post message the result to the service worker yeah we, we we've that's, done that, that's we've complex. done that with with uh, with iframes as well um but it's ugly it's ugly yeah I mean, I think that's that's kind of the point. All, all of these things are things that actually already sort of work, but they do it in an ugly or inefficient way. And, and the, the aim of these use cases is to try and push a little more efficiency and, 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 and beauty into the thing. Um, so maybe next slide. Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of use cases here for, for um, live betting, um, live auctions where low latency but mass broadcast is something that um, that's required. And there are a bunch of reasons why this turns out to be quite difficult to do at the moment. And one of them is audio autoplay on a, um, a device that isn't sending media. Um, it's just like the whole, the whole autoplay is horrifically um, uh, unpredictable, particularly on Chrome. Um, and the other aspect is that a lot of these people have DRM or, or other um, assets, subtitle assets, and it would be good to have those somehow communicated. I, I've been called out on the idea of necessarily doing over those channels. Um, I don't. It, there could be RTP extensions. There could be some other way. But it would be really good to get those out um, in a way that uh, that can be consumed by the endpoints, and ideally with as little change to the like their infrastructure as possible. Um, Just a question, Tim. Uh, doesn't MSE support this? Like, if you if you provide the data channel buffers to MSE, can't you use like uh, uh, DRM protected containerized media? Is that not true? I don't think you could feed it into. A, I don't think there's an easy way to feed that into a. Um, into a, a video element, for example. No, it would be fed to the MSE API. I need to look at that. Do you, do, I mean, um, okay. Let me let me check whether that's doable. Question. But I had the impression uh, it wasn't doable. Entering, yes. Okay. What? Uh, I think it's it's doable. You can pass use the data channel as a transport, to reconstruct the thing, and pass it to MSE. But that's that's really going through a lot of hooks, and um, I think Hi. I put a, a comment in the in the PR. Um, there are the stuff we would like to be using to be able to use the video elements like the the, the media people do it. So, right. for example, send several audio track with different languages and send different subtitle for different languages uh, to be able to choose which one you, we actually play back or display. And right now, when the source is a WebRTC stream, it just plays everything, right? So let's say you do it the old Japanese way with the, uh, a stereo channel with the, the right in Japanese and the left in English, then you're going to have both language being played today if the source piped into the video element is, is, a, is a WebRTC track and not in the other case. Well, the, there's a few subtleties like that where the treatment of the media, depending on the source, is, is, di is different which is uh, problematic. I'm, I'm no longer clear about this issue. Uh, is, it, is this issue tackling um, audio tracks coming from WebRTC RTP pipeline? Or is it about audio track data coming from data channels and then fed to MSE? So the um, 
from my perspective, and I think this is something that we probably end up needing to discuss in, in more depth. Uh, it, from my perspective, this is about trying to take a video element and a, a video source. Uh, you know, so I've got a file on my server and I want to send it to 10,000 people, or not a file, a live, a live stream. Maybe it's a file, but, but, I, but it's got DRM in it. And I want to send it to a bunch of video elements in browsers that already support that DRM. But if that's coming in over WebRTC, that won't work. I think we're quickly running out of time, so we should. Okay. Uh, so let's 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 move on to the 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 last one, which I think is um, is interesting as well. Just cover that. Um, so the idea here is that there are a lot of use cases where we don't need the full offer answer um, for one reason or another. We kind of know what we're going to get. And this is often true for very small devices, which only have a very limited set of things or for servers that are ingesting data. Um, so I was kind of interested in the idea of having a, a URI format that defines the minimum data that you need to get a kind of live WebRTC connection, and then have the rest of the optionalities be done as configuration. And it turns out that you only need about four variables to 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 set up a WebRTC connection, um, and then after that you can kind of just send your video and things can work out what the tracks are or whatever. Or you can signal additional data over over the data channel if you want to. I mean, I realize this is contentious in terms of being kind of not being offer answer, but I, I think it's there's a bunch of web developers out there who would find this a much easier mindset. There's a, a certain amount of setting up connections without offer answer is, uh, and is is an element that runs through a lot of scenarios. Yeah. I mean, publish, publish, subscribe is another name for the same, same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time, but I, oh. I want to get clear what our next steps are. So I think the, the question I'd like to ask is, are there any of these that we we kind of don't want to talk about, where that I shouldn't work on? Like, are there some that I should just eliminate? I see them all as valid use cases. Yeah, so do I. OK, so I guess the next question is, what are my next steps? How do I best progress them? Merge. <laughs> uh, if you think that's it, I'm not sure they're in a state to do that, but I'm happy to try. Uh, uh, how about, um, I think what my personal view would be to try to try to work. Uh, I will work with Tim on all of these and try to. I think they would be good for a discussion in January. Uh, bring them back maybe at the next level of detail. Cool. That makes maybe sense. Maybe summarize yeah. them in an in an email thread. Yeah, an email actually work. would be good. Yeah. Are we sure that the uh, face tracking API is for this working group though? That seems kind of like a higher level thing. That could apply outside of WebRTC as well. Yeah, you could do face tracking on videos, images. Yeah, maybe we we need to finesse the language on that. Maybe it's not that with the APIs there, but that we need some note there. And whether it and whether it ends up being a use case, I don't know. But I I do want to kind of work it in somewhere into our documents. I think it's a or or not even the face tracking, but the non discriminatory requirement. Um, right. I want yeah, that yeah, in somewhere. Right. Yeah, no, I'm think not saying not the problem is not valid, but whether it fits right. this audience. Or... But, but, but I think it would be fine to have like a requirement that we will not address ourselves, but uh, delegate to another group. Uh, I don't think that's yeah. okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Well, sorry okay. to everybody we didn't get to. Uh, I guess we'll uh, put out a doodle poll for our January meeting and hopefully take uh, everything that we didn't get to and put put it on the agenda for January. It's too. Is it uh, unrealistic to do a catch-up meeting in, in in December? There are some items downstream that would really be nice to have a 
Yes. Have it. Uh, well, uh, let's ask just this group. Uh, you know, we can always do another doodle poll. Um, what are you thinking, Harold? Just off the top of your head. Mm. Two weeks from now. Look at the calendar. T today is the second. Yeah. So week week of sixteenth. That's probably the latest week. Okay. The earliest, well, uh, the latest we can do it if we do it in the, okay. December. Uh, I will take an action item to put out the doodle poll and we'll see what comes back. Sounds good. Sounds good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>